for the doctrine of the faith, the Vatican office responsible for the promoting and preserving of Catholic teaching. In his position at the Vatican, he oversaw the development of Divine Worship, the Missal, a new book of texts for the celebration of Mass in the personal ordinariates around the world. The Vatican has authorized the use of these new texts for Mass beginning this Sunday, November 29th. With today's appointment, Bishop-elect Lopes becomes the first bishop for any of the ordinariates in the world. We'll start this morning with remarks from Monsignor Jeffrey Steenson, who was appointed by Pope Benedict to be the first ordinary, or leader, of the ordinariate in January 2012. We'll then hear from Bishop Alec Lopes, and then we'll take questions from the media. Monsignor Steenson? <clears throat> what wonderful news from the Holy See this morning that Pope Francis has appointed Monsignor Stephen Lopes to be the first bishop of the personal ordinary of the chair of St. Peter for Canada and for the United States. This is the happy outcome of much careful consultation with the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith, to whom I first made this request almost a year ago. I welcome this news with all my heart, for the ordinariate has now progressed to the point where a bishop is much needed for our life and mission. A bishop will help to give the ordinariate the stability and the permanence necessary to fulfill its mission to be a work of Catholic unity, whose roots are to be found in the great texts of the Second Vatican Council. That the ordinariate would ultimately be headed by a bishop has been the intention of Anglican Orum Chaitibus, the Apostolic Constitution, under which we were established in 2012. It is indeed an encouraging sign that we have reached that goal. With the inauguration of our new Missal, Divine Worship, this first Sunday of Advent, the time seems especially propitious. It was on the occasion of my reception into the Catholic Church in 2007 when I first met Monsignor Lopes and we have worked closely ever since. There is no one who knows better the work of the pastoral provision and the ordinariates. Those entities created in response to Anglicans seeking full communion with the Catholic Church. Monsignor Lopes has been deeply involved with the Anglicanae Traditionis Commission, charged with identifying that liturgical expression which has nourished and maintained Catholic faith amongst Anglicans throughout the period of ecclesial separation, and which in these days has given rise to aspirations for full communion with the Catholic Church. He is thus uniquely qualified to be our first bishop. It is particularly noteworthy that the Holy Father's appointment is the culmination of a process for selecting an ordinary that is laid out in Article 4 of the Complementary Norms of our Constitution 
and the Kenorum Chadifus. This provides for a significant consultative process that begins with the Governing Council of the Ordinariate presenting a turn of candidates. I'm grateful to the members of our Governing Council who accomplished this task with discernment and with discretion. I am grateful too for the encouragement, for the wise counsel and the support of the members of the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops and the Canadian Conference of Catholic Bishops during these first four years of our ordinary existence. I will always treasure the friendships made with these bishops. Their warm welcome for us pilgrims has certainly deepened the joy that we know as Catholics. And now I'm pleased to present to you my friend, our bishop-elect, Monsignor Stephen Mose. Jesus Christ. Amen. Dear friends, it is with humility and in a spirit of obedience to our Lord that I have accepted the appointment to serve as Bishop of the Personal Ordinary of the Chair of St. Peter. Trusting in the intercession of Our Lady, the consciousness of my own limitations, humanly speaking, yields to gratitude, hope, and joy. And it's about those three things I'd like to tell you about this morning. I'm grateful for the ecumenical vision of Pope Benedict XVI, who reminded us that the unity of faith allows for a vibrant diversity in the expression of that faith. I'm grateful for the fatherly care of Pope Francis, who continues to show that care for the ordinarius, born first in the Missal and now in the careful consideration of the clergy who seek to join us, and even in the appointment of the first ordinary bishop. Pope Francis is making this model of communion in diversity ever more concrete. I'm grateful for Monsignor Jeffrey Steenson, aren't we all? <laughs> Who has been for me an outstanding example of wisdom, graciousness, and evangelical zeal. He has truly the heart of a priest, and I am confident that all of us, faithful and clergy of the ordinary alike, join me in saying, thank you, Monsignor. Thank you, because we could not have asked for a better leader to lay the foundations for the ordinary in the United States and Canada. <laughs> Through my work at the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith, I have been privileged to come to know firsthand the priests and the communities of the ordinary of the Chair of St. Peter. They have a passion for the communion of the Church and for the truth of the, of the Gospel as it's contained in sacred scripture and tradition. And that fills me with great hope. There is a tremendous vitality to the ordinary which we bring to the universal Church. And I know that for that reason alone, there is indeed a bright future ahead of us. It is also a great joy and privilege to be joined to this particular church under the patronage of St. Peter and to share its mission of proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ. I stand today among men and women for whom Catholic communion is no simple idea or abstract concept, but they have sacrificed for it, they have displayed courage and fortitude in favor of it, and they have opened wide the doors of their hearts to the infinite possibilities of what God's grace can accomplish in and through them. It should and it can move every Catholic to the heart of every Catholic to witness this amazing courage and vitality in the life of our church. And so here we stand together in this thing with a admittedly peculiar name, Ordinarian, <laughs> but with a dynamism and a beauty all its own. It is the Lord who has accomplished this in his church. And great are the works of the Lord. Amen. Amen. Thank you. We can now take questions from the press. Joe? Uh, Monsignor, welcome to Houston. Thank you. I'm Joe McLean with uh, KSHJ 1430 AM Catholic Radio in Houston. And I have a couple of questions. I imagine that 
it was exciting to get the news, but I also imagine it was a bit uh, apprehensive or fearful to be named Terrifying. a Terrifying. <laughs> so I really wanted to get to your input on what that felt like to receive that uh, that call. And then number two, I would love to know what your long-term goals are for the ordinary. The call uh, from Cardinal Muller, the prefect of the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith, um, uh, began with, uh, he said to me in German, yeah, it's me, go wait for me in my office. <laughs> <laughs> now, my mother's been a Catholic school teacher for 47 years, I know what that is. <laughs> but, you know, in, in, in the moment, you know, he came in, we sat down, he said it, and, you know, after... After the initial gulp, um, truly, it, it is, is just in my mind, I immediately picture the many people in the ordinary that I know. And because this is now the third or fourth time, my fourth time I've been to Houston, uh, here at Our Lady of Walsingham, but I've gotten to know the priests on other occasions, and it was in thinking of them, who are truly friends, and many of them around the room today, um, yeah, I know these folks. And, well, really, there's nowhere else, and with no one else, I'd rather be. So, in that sense, that, that calm comes, uh, comes rather readily. Back. In terms of long-term goals, I'm not sure. Uh, I can tell you a couple of short-term goals. Um, I have to get out and visit the parishes. You know, 42 parish communities scattered among uh, all, a lot of United States and five Canadian provinces. So... Uh, I'll tell you this, when I was talking with Pope Francis on Wednesday, I reminded him that he said to the bishops, to the new bishops, now don't become airport bishops. <laughs> <laughs> I asked for a little exception. <laughs> so in that, first, in that first year and a half or so, I imagine I'll be on the road a lot, visiting the communities, visiting the priests in their parishes, getting to know the faithful, and together with them, with the governing council, then we can start looking at some long-term goals together. Thank you. Other questions? Just from the press? From the press, yes. <laughs> Ryan? Sir, how do you explain this to non-Catholics? <laughs> how do you explain this to Catholics? <laughs> <laughs> Ordinary and chair of St. Peter, you know, I mean, it's kind of two abstract concepts put together. You know, an ordinary is, is very similar to a diocese. It's just a diocese without territory. Most dioceses, as you know, come with a place. Galveston, Houston, Victoria, San Antonio. It's a defined territory. We're defined not by territory, but the legal term is by personality. I like to say that because we're nice, classy, shiny personalities. <laughs> but it's, it's, it's these people who have come from a certain cultural and religious tradition together, regardless of where they are in the country, they share a certain affinity, a bond of faith, of experience, and of a way of expressing that faith that allows the church to, to bring them together and call them an ordinary or a non-territorial diocese. And so that's why we're kind of spread all over the place. It's because of where these communities have come from. But where they come from also has to be balanced with where they are. They're Catholics. They're participating in the life and the vitality of the Roman Catholic Church across our country. Period. The end. Stop. You know? So that's, uh, that's who we are. And we're going to continue to bring the gifts we have, the traditions from where we've come, and put them at the service of the church where we are today. So that's, uh, that's the, the first part of it, the ordinariate. Then we're the ordinariate of the chair of St. Peter. The chair of St. Peter, again, it's kind of an abstract concept, but it simply means that's that, that symbol of the authority of the Pope, of St. Peter, the Bishop of Rome. And we have uh, a very, very unique and very, very special relationship with the Bishop of Rome. Uh, with, the, with the chair of St. Peter, um, I, as the Bishop of the Ordinariate, still look to the Bishop of Rome, to Pope Francis, and to his successors as truly the Bishop of the Ordinariate. Um, and, and he is the one who leads us, not in some, again, uh, kind of abstract way, but very concretely and very directly. And so it just kind of highlights uh, our special relationship that we have with him, because it was the Pope who created 
this jurisdiction in the United States and Canada, another one in Australia, another one in England and Wales, and so we have a particular relationship with them. So those are what the words mean, and that's who we are. So there are three ordinariates around the world, or...? There are three ordinariates currently around the world. There could be more. Um, it is certainly uh, possible that if, when uh, the ordinary in, well, when our ordinary in Canada, Canada is a, is a territory of, of this, this ordinary, uh, that when it grows uh, a bit more, it can certainly become an ordinary on its own. There are other parts in the world that have, you know, um, more robust Anglican backgrounds that uh, are asking questions and are exploring things. And, you know, it would be uh, hoped that, that there could be the establishment of other ordinariates there, but for now there are three. And so this all began approximately four years ago, is that right? Or is the that... canonical establishment, so setting the thing up, the conversations that led to today began in 2007, really. Well, that's not exactly true. The conversations began in the 1950s. It was Pope Pius XII, imagine that, who was the first person, the first pope, to grant dispensations for married Protestant and Anglican ministers who desired to become Catholic priests, to become priests as married men. And so the popes since then have always spoken of the special relationship that the Catholic Church has with the Anglican Communion. Even the Second Vatican Council spoke in a very direct way of that special relationship. Uh, the, that late relationship then, with, under Pope Paul VI and Pope John Paul II, began to take on these forms, special forms and, and uh, possibilities for clergy and communities to come into full communion with the Catholic Church. And then in 2007, there was really a, uh, a, a new impetus, a new push. Is there a way for communities with their pastors to come into the church, not one by one and a little bit here and a little bit there, but in a corporate way, in a united way, so that our parish doesn't lose what makes our parish special. It doesn't lose the relationship that we have with our priest, with, uh, with our pastor. Can the whole parish come in together with the pastor? And that was a model that has not really been explored before by the Catholic Church. So this really then, in the apostolic constitution of Pope Benedict XVI, is a new model for Christian unity. And that begins in 2007, and then the publication of that constitution in 2009. So you'll be ministering to uh, Catholics who have come from the Anglican faith, one kind or another. Correct, and then all the people who have decided with, uh, with, to join them, those who have been evangelized by them, those who have been drawn into their communities for the celebration of Mass, um, the ordinary cannot ever be just something, you know, um, it, it's not a ghetto, in other words. We don't, we don't come into it to kind of stay contentedly here, walled off in our own little, in our own little castles, but we're constantly going out to minister, to preach the gospel, to help the poor, in order to draw ever more people into a life-giving relationship with Jesus Christ. And so, uh, a good ordinary at parish is conscious of where it's come from. It knows its history, and it knows the value of bringing that history and that expression of the faith that's nurtured in that English Christian tradition to bear on the wider church. But they're always going out and drawing new members in. A good ordinary parish is therefore a growing ordinary parish. Jeff? May I ask Monsignor Steenson a question? Yeah. Monsignor, now that you are retired, uh, what do we expect from you? Fishing or hiking? Or what? Yeah, we'll say anything about, about retirement. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right to work you go. Well, one of the things I've, I'm so looking forward to doing is is renewing my love of the fathers of the church, those yes. early Christian writers. They brought me to the Catholic Church, and um, I have the privilege of being able to teach that at St. Mary, uh, St. Mary Seminary here. And um, I, I just now I will be somebody's obedient servant. <laughs> you all heard it. <laughs> well, I wanted to ask quote General MacArthur. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I was, I've always wanted to do this. Um, in, in 
1951, General Douglas MacArthur addressed the United States Congress, and he said, quoted this old ballad, old soldiers never die, they just fade away. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, I think, see, there's no, uh, when you asked for this a year ago, were there any concerns other than just wanting a bishop for the ordinarian, any health risks or anything like that? I am in good shape. <laughs> <laughs> um, I have, I, I have a, a class three medical license from the Federal Aviation Administration. <laughs> <laughs> this is not for health reasons. <laughs> okay, good. No, um, it, it, we, it was so obvious that we needed to have a bishop. Um, and that, that was just the next necessary step that, was, that we had to take. I'm a happily married man of 41 years. Amen. And obviously I can't be a bishop in the Catholic Church. So it just is so obvious. We need a bishop. I can't be a bishop. There's a bishop. <laughs> Other questions from the press? Anyone else? Uh, question. Archbishop Fiorenza. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Now I'm nervous. Um, now, <laughs> uh, now that uh, there's a bishop in charge of the Ordinaria, before Our Lady of Walsingham's church was a principal church, will it now become the cathedral? Amen. Yes. <laughs> find an analogy of that with the military ordinariates. The military ordinariate in the United States does not have a cathedral um, because all of their chapels, all of their properties are actually uh, owned and operated by the, the United States government. But many other countries have a military ordinary for the care of their military forces wherever they are throughout the world and they all have cathedrals. So absolutely, it's a way that um, it's the way that some of our language, some of the way that we're talking about ourselves can just become more resonant with, uh, with, with what is familiar in Catholic life. So yes, absolutely. Can we have another cathedral in use? Another cathedral. <laughs> Very good. Thank you so much to everyone for coming this morning. I have three closing notes. First, Bishop-elect Lopes will be in Houston this Sunday to can celebrate Mass with Monsignor Stinson at Our Lady of Walsingham, our new cathedral. Um, <clears throat> mass is at 11.15 a.m. Everyone is welcome. For those of you in the press who may want to cover the Mass, please get in touch with me afterwards. I'd be happy to assist you. For those of you in the press who may need an interview in Spanish, I have a number of individuals available for you, and I'm happy to assist with that as well. Or if you need to do a follow-up with Bishop Alec Lopes, we'll stay here at the podium for that as well. Last but not least, the Mass of Ordination for Bishop-elect Lopes is scheduled for February 2, 2016. And with that, thank you for coming. Yeah. Happy Thanksgiving. Happy Thanksgiving. I'm sorry? Yeah. To be determined. <laughs> <laughs> Happy Thanksgiving! <laughs>